Many uh, pastors and teachers, when they teach on peace, they'll often reference a story that I'm about to reference. It's Mark 4.35 through verse 40. And it's a common story that a lot of people know. It's about Jesus, and he tells his disciples, we're going to go to the other side, and they get in a boat, and they go through a storm. And And I'll read it to you quickly so that we get the, if you haven't done your Bible reading this week, you'll be covered, all right? It says, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were beating into the boat, so it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, whenever I see Jesus interacting with the disciples, I always want to slow down my reading. I always want to say, what is Jesus doing here? What is the example that he's setting? Because remember, Jesus is showing the disciples how to live on earth. Remember, he's discipling, right? That's what you do when you disciple. And so I'm going, Jesus, what is your point here? What, what is going on in this situation? Because back in those days, there was only three modes of transportation. There was walking or running, donkey or horse, or going on a boat. It was common. Look, I, I fly about 150,000 miles, 200,000 miles every year on, a, on an airplane. Uh, I tra- just traveling, going to different places. And, uh, and I could walk through an airport with my eyes closed. I feel like you know, I've just done the routine so many times, taking off my shoes and my belts and all that stuff. And, uh, and, and it's not glorious flying. But I, I know that, that flying is uh, the safest mode of transportation that we have today. That thousands of thousands of thousands of thousands of thousands of flights fly out every day. And you may hear of one going down every few years commercially. And even so, these past few years have been tragic. Uh, that still is really, really rare. Like in America alone in 2013, there were 404 million American passengers that flew. That's a lot of flying. You don't realize it, but it happens. And I know that turbulence is uh, just a difference of air pressure and that oftentimes when a plane is going up uh, or going through a cloud or descending, oftentimes that difference in air pressure will make the uh, plane shake a bit, but it really doesn't bring planes down. Uh, Turbulence is a normal thing that happens in planes. And I can always tell when somebody who's an amateur flyer is sitting next to me. Because oftentimes when that plane's going up, or when there's a bit of turbulence, I see them white-knuckling the armrests next to me. They might be grimacing their face, you know. And I go, oh, isn't that, isn't that silly? They think they're in danger. <laughs> they must be an amateur flyer, you know. But when I see the flight attendant or the stewardess get scared and nervous, when I see them saying, everyone, sit down, sit down, buckle your seatbelts, buckle your seatbelts, get out of the bathroom, get out of the bathroom. Well, then I get scared. You know, then I'm like commanding angels under the wings. I'm like preaching in my prayer language. I have my Bible out, ready for my last salvation message. (laughs) Why? Because they know what it's like to go through a situation that planes might not survive. They're, They're experts. And you see, folks, these disciples, many of them were fishermen. They were expert boatsmen. They knew what it was like for boats to go through a storm that they might not survive. And there was something that was interesting that had happened in that situation where the fear they were facing, they accepted inside them. And the one thing about fear, when it gets inside you, it spreads like wildfire. It just keeps going. And, you know, for some reason, the only thing that, doesn't, that makes you feel better as a fearful person, I don't know if you realize this, is to tell the next person how fearful they should be. You know that they're always like, "Oh, you didn't hear what happened? Oh, you need to be afraid. You should be. We should all be afraid right now." You know, and then they, let's tell more people. You know, like I mean, that's how news, you know, media they know that principle. And so, and 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 I could just see the disciples in in how this unfolding was happening, and they're going, "You know, Jesus, Jesus, wake up! This is a fearful moment. Why are you asleep? This is a fearful moment." And Jesus, facing the same exact storm. Instead of accepting the fear that was in front of him, he releases the peace that's inside of him, and it overcomes the storm. Now, many people will take this section of Scripture and say that the peace of God will get you through the storm. Now, there is biblical basis for that. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your hand and your staff, they comfort me. There will be times where you will need the peace of God to sustain you as you're going through the storm. That's true. That's biblical. But I don't think Jesus was making that point in this story. Because that's not the example he portrayed. You know, if that's the point he wanted to make, he would have showed him that. He would have said, okay, all right, folks, let's, uh, uh, guys, let's just, uh, let's hold hands, let's sit tight, let's sing psalms and, and focus on scripture until we get to the other side. But that's not what he did. He, he exemplified to them what to do and then rebuked them for not knowing that they could do that too. See, this is just my opinion, okay? This is my opinion. But if you read that scripture over again, in the beginning, Jesus declared the destiny over their lives. He said, we're going to the other side. And this is just my opinion. But whenever I feel, whenever a real storm, tangible storm, challenges the destiny over your life, you have every right to to stand up to it and allow the peace of God to overcome it. There's a, a story I like to tell about this time I was in Baltimore, Maryland. I was working with uh, Jay Baylor and Doug Johnson. They had a wonderful ministry uh, feeding people in the Central Park. They would bring a, a van, excuse me, a bus, a food truck, food bus that they converted to serve hot meals. They'd rock it right up to the Central Park. They brought clothing for people. And it was around November when it was going to get cold and uh, for all sorts of uh, age groups to, to get warm clothing. And, um, and then they did something really uh, amazing. They took out some lawn chairs and they put them in the center of the park. And they said, you know, if anyone needs healing in their body, if they need freedom from addiction or deliverance, if you sit in one of these chairs, we're going to pray for you. And it was awesome. And we would take turns at different stations so that no one got burned out at one station. Everyone had a chance to, to do all the different things. And, and I just happened to be praying for, for the sick at, or, and deliverance at my chair. And, uh, and this gentleman, he's passing by me, and he, and he stops, and he looks at me, and he says, what are you guys doing here? I said, you know, we're feeding people, we're clothing people, but I said, but right here we're praying for people who are sick. And he said, um, would you pray for me? I said, sure. Kevin wasn't, he didn't need anything else. He had a nice leather jacket on, a Bluetooth headset, a, a nice golf cap, uh, but, but he said that he had a stroke three years prior. See, I said, Kevin passed by me. He didn't walk by me. He had uh, damage to the right side of his body. He had a clawed hand like this that he couldn't open. And he said he had something called drop foot where he couldn't pick up his foot. The same side of his body was still disabled. And he actually had a, a, like a cane, like a four-pronged cane that he would drag his foot behind him when he walked and held his hand like this. I said, sure, Kevin, I'll pray for you. And um, Kevin didn't know the Lord yet. He wasn't church you know, trained. He didn't know how to assume the position. You know what I mean? And... Uh, so I was like, all right, Kevin, close your eyes. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, uh, and I just prayed a short prayer. I, I, I just thank God for Kevin. I thank God for his healing power. I, I welcome the Holy Spirit to come in that moment to manifest healing in Kevin's body. And, um, and I, I've prayed for hundreds of people up to this point. And then all of a sudden, being led by the Spirit, I've never done this before. Uh, I felt like the Lord told me to put my hand on his head, and I put my hand on his head, and I, these words came out of my mouth. I, I just said, and I command all chaos to leave, and I speak the peace of God over your body. I said, Kevin, check it out. It was only a 20-second prayer. It wasn't anything eloquent. You know, I used to think that the longer and more eloquent the prayer, the better, you know? Or if you really wanted your prayers to go fast, you, you furrowed your brow, you know? You were just like, come on, God, I mean this. It puts like a zing on them, you know what I mean? Anyway, that's apparently not true. So, um, I said, Kevin, test it out. And he went like this. He went, oh my God, oh my God, what'd you do to me? What'd you do to me? Who are you? Do you have a card? I said, <laughs> I said Kevin, I'm a Christian. I said, Jesus loves you. And, I, and when I saw this, I said, surely God's healed your foot. I said, check out your foot. He went, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Then he was going up to people who had no idea who he was. He's like, look at my hand. Look at this. And they're like, okay, sir, that's great. You know, like, get out of here. And, uh, and for 40 minutes, he would be sitting down, standing up at the bench park. I'm going, what are you doing, Kevin? He's like, I'm just making sure I could do this. I couldn't do this anymore. And it was easy to bring Kevin to Jesus that day. <laughs> easy. Kevin, do you want to know the God who healed your body? 
Yeah, what do I need to do to be saved? You know, kind of thing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, overcame the storm in that case. I love doctors in medicine. I think they're a gift from God. I don't, you know, even Jesus told the leper, go show yourself to the high priest. It's not a, it's not a lack of faith to go get verification from a doctor or to, you know, take medicine. And so, but they didn't have an answer for Kevin in that moment. And that, that particular storm challenged his destiny and, and, it, and his peace overcame that storm. I, um, I love chapters and verses in the Bible. They're, they're amazing. You know, it helps us reference things. If I say John 3.16, if you grew up in church, you know, that's for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we know that because of the chapters and verses. Uh, they break up stories for us. But you know, like John didn't have chapters and verses. We added them as a church to help the reader. And, uh, and so, you know, like John wasn't going, John chapter 3, verse 16, you know, he wasn't. So I have a little thing here with Mark 4.35 through verse 40. Because that's the story of the storm that I just read. Because I don't think the story's over. See, in Mark 5, verses 1 through 15, it says that the boat touches the other side. It's not done. The story's still going. Many of us know the story. It says that a demonized man comes to meet Jesus there. He's so full of demons that the people there hate him. He terrorizes the city. He's a known terrorist. They, it says that they, he runs around naked, cutting himself, terrorizing people, um, howling, all this sorts of stuff. And it says that the people hate him so much that they chain him up and throw him in a cave. You got to hate somebody a lot to do that to them. And so that the demons inside this man are too strong anyway, and he breaks the chains, and he terrorizes these people anyway, making them live in fear. And it says, many of us know the story, it says that Jesus cast the demons out of the man and into the pigs, and the pigs run into the sea. And it says that the townspeople are coming to see what's happening. Most likely, it's their pigs. Okay? And this is how evil you know these people are. It says that they see this man, who they know, it says they see him talking to Jesus, sitting. It says that they see him sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. And next few words boggle my mind because it says this, and they were terrified. You see, when you have the peace of God, the enemy's terrified. You become a weapon fashioned to advance the kingdom of God. Hey, I'm so excited that we're doing the stirring again. I'm, I'm going to be with my good friends, Paul Martini and John Prudian. Uh, we've done stirrings all over the United States. We've seen countless miracles take place, um, pe metal dissolving in people's body, tumors dissolving, people being healed of autoimmune diseases and cancer. We've seen hundreds of people saved, if not thousands of people saved. So many people equipped and trained, you know, the stirring um, was named by Paul Martini as he was praying and asking uh, the Holy Spirit, what, what conference do you want me to start? And the Lord says, you know, so many people have done so many uh, and gone to so many conferences and schools. They've, they've got a lot of giftings. They've got a lot of prophetic words. What they need to do is stir up the gift of God that's already been given to them through the laying on of hands. And so the stirring is all about personal ministry. It's about stirring up those giftings. And yes, you'll get more prophetic words. And yes, you'll get a lot of impartation. We've specifically structured the stirrings to have longer times of ministry. So there'll be training, um, there'll be long worship and, and long times of ministry just to minister to you and your family. And so I wanna invite you to come, be a part of the stirring. Let's get stirred up together and see Jesus get his full reward. Thank you.